book of Esther, where we'll be reading chapters 9 and 10. So if you want to follow along with me. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Oswaras to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha, and Dalphon, and Aspatha, and Poretha, and Adalia, and Eridatha, and Parmashta, and Arasai, and Aradai, and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they, had no, they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those who killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting. And gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that a feast, a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and, and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Oswaris both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as a month that had been turned from them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do, and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast poor, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. And, but when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term poor. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and of what they had faced in this matter and of what happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city and, the, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease 
among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai, the Jew, gave full written authority, confirming the second letter of Mount Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Oswaris in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring. That Haman put out. And then a couple weeks ago, we looked at the Edict of Life that, uh, that God put out through Mordecai, right? He said, no, Jews are going to be able to defend themselves. And so th- this whole book of Esther is leading to this point, right? Like all great dramas, right? all great stories, right? There's this huge tension that's building up, you know, in uh, this story, right? What's going to happen on that day? What's going to happen on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar when these two edicts are going to go after each other, when the Jews are condemned to die, but yet God has saved them through the ability to defend themselves, right? What is going to happen in this great uh, tension, right? What's going to happen when the Avengers finally face off against Thanos, or what's going to happen when Luke finally faces off against Darth Vader, right? You get these, you know, huge tension buildups, and you get to that moment, you know, where you're expecting, you know, maybe there's going to be, like, this great climax, there's going to be this great battle, and all you get here is simply just a little description of what happens, right? Literally, the book of Esther just, it doesn't even give you any, like, kind of tension buildup. There's no descriptions of great battles. It's just simply, very simply, the Jews gain mastery over those who hated them. It's almost just like a description of what happens, right? After all that buildup, the tension just gets resolved, you know, extremely, extremely quickly. Uh, One commentator, you know, makes a note that there's, he says this, he says, there's little doubt that in literary terms, the drama has fizzled out and it has been replaced by somewhat tedious reportage and analysis, right? And so he kind of criticizes the book of, the author of the book of Esther to be like, you know, you're building towards this great tension and now all the drama is just like, you know, you're just kind of fizzling towards the ending as you just report uh, on what happens. But, um, But in some ways, as we look at this, uh, why, does the reason, why does the author of Esther write it this way? Right? Why not give us accounts of great battles and, and, and why not you know, feed on this tension that, that he's been building? Well, I think the reason is uh, simply because of this. Right? The reason why all we get is a simple recounting of the facts is because the outcome of this battle has already been determined. Right? The reason why this is such a boring account is because God has already won the battle, that this is already God's battle, that when Mordecai, when, when Mordecai set out his edict of life, at that point, the resolution of this battle has already been confirmed, right? The, the results of this battle were never in doubt, right? Was there any doubt that the Avengers would defeat Thanos? You know, no. Were there any doubt that, you know, Luke would defeat, you know, Darth Vader, right? But we kind of already know the ending because the ending is determined by God, now you might say, okay, well, those two things are, you know, they're stories, right? And the storyteller, the authors can just write it however they want, right? Of course, they're going to write it, and it's going to be a good ending. But this is real life, right? This is real life. Does it really work that way in real life as well? Right, but as I mentioned last week, you know, why do we love these great endings? Right? Why do we love these good, positive endings? And I think the reason for that is because these great stories right, really speaks to this desire of our hearts, Right, these great stories actually speak to the gospel story, right, the greatest story ever told. The reason why we love these positive, good, you know, feel-good resolutions, right, because it really speaks to a desire, a need in our heart that this is what we are looking for. This is what we want. Right? And as God, as the author of our salvation, it means that the results of our lives, the resolution of our lives is also confirmed. You know, interestingly, though, you know, in recent trends, uh, there's kind of been you know, people trying to enjoy movies that are actually the opposite and have really unhappy endings. I didn't watch it all the way through, but I know, like, I read, you know, critique of the Game of Thrones, you know, for example, of, like, man, the ending was too positive, right? It should have been, like, super-duper negative and super-super depressing. And I think that's interesting, too, right? I think the reason why maybe some of us want really miserable endings is because maybe that's also reflective of life in this sinful world, right? In some ways, the, the miserable ending, you know, speaks to the sin and the corruption of our lives, right, in the world that we live in. But you know, in many ways, we want that, you know, feel-good resolution, even though when we know it's coming, right, it's still we want that because there's a desire that we have in our hearts. And so, you know, maybe if you're like the girl in the song Tonghua and you think fairy tales are all fake, um, 
If you don't get that joke, don't worry about it. But, you know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, you know, that God is the author of our salvation, right? That if our life is a story, right, then God is the author. And what that means is that he has the power as that of an author, right? And just as the outcome of that 13th day of the 12th month was determined, in the same way, God also guarantees our victory, right, over our enemies of sin and evil and death, right? And this is the confidence that we have in life, knowing that the battle belongs to God and the battle has already been won. I think this is the reason why it's such a boring recounting of that day because the outcome is already guaranteed, right? The author of Esther is trying to tell us that it's really God who is behind the decree of life, the edict of life, and we know for certain that the Jews would be saved, now, how do we know that it was God? Right? How do we know that it was really God that saved, that delivered them, that saved the Israelites? You know, because we mentioned you know, that God never shows up in, this path, in the entire book. Right? Nowhere ever in this entire book do we see mention of God. But the way that the, the author of the book of Esther indicates that this is actually God's victory is through the various words and phrases that he uses. And these words and phrases would invoke previous promises of God. And so... To give you an example of what I mean, right? So in Jeremiah uh, 31, 13, this is God's uh, promise to the Israelites. He says, Then the young women shall rejoice in the dance, and the young men uh, and the old shall be merry, and I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. Right? This is the promise that God made to the Israelites. Then in Esther 9, uh, 22, right, we see this, the same wording being reflected, right? That God turned their sorrow into gladness, mourning into a holiday, right? By using these same familiar phrases of God's promises, is, the author of Esther is, is crediting God with their deliverance. Or another one, in mean, 1 Samuel, this is uh, the Davidic covenant, uh, it says that, uh, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, and so the same thing in, in verse 22 in Esther, right, it says, and the Jews got relief from their enemies, right? By using the same phrases of God's promises, the author of Esther's trying to tell us this is God who delivered the Jews. Or one last one that I think uh, is going to require a little bit more of an explanation, but I do want to explain this just because it's going to lead into our next point. But the, the last one is here in Exodus 17. And it, it says here, it says that, uh, and the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in the book and recite it in the years of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of uh, Amalek from under the heaven. Now, why is that relevant? Well, in Esther 9 to 24, it says that Haman was an Agagite. Now, n n maybe not everyone remembers, but all the way back in chapter 2, uh, the reason why this is relevant is because... Uh, it, all the way back in chapter 2, we read this, this name given to Haman, right? It's Haman the Agagite, right? And for a lot of us, including me, if I didn't read the commentaries, I'll be like, okay, Agagite, whatever, I'll just skip over it. But these names are actually really important because Agagite tells us who his descendants were. And the, and the Agagite uh, that Haman was descended from, it was a king of the... Um, um, uh, of the Am Am uh, Amalekites, right? And so all the way back in, um, in when, the, when the Jews were coming out of Egypt, uh, the Agagites were descendants of Agog, who was king over the Amalekites. And when Moses was leading the people out of, the, out of Egypt, the Agagites eventually, or the Amalekites, have the dubious achievements of being the very first nation to attack Israel, right? So when the, Moses was coming out of the Egypt, the Amalekites attacked them to try to gain mastery and to take their plunder and destroy them. And so this is like an ancient battle, right, between these two Israelites and Amalekites. And if you fast forward a little bit during the time of Saul, right, during the first king of Israel, uh, God commanded Saul to uh, annihilate the Amalekites. And uh, this is a means of God's judgment against them. And, you know, so Back then, God would use nations to execute his judgment over other nations, uh, which, by the way, would include the Israelites, right? Because God also used, like, Assyria and Babylon to ex execute his judgment over the Israelites. But, and so, king, so God commanded King Saul, right, to kill all the Amalekites due to their sin. But out of King Saul's own selfish desire, he's, he decides to keep some of the plunder, right? God says, just destroy them, but don't take any of their plunder, and so King Saul says, yeah, but that's like some juicy plunder. I want to take it. And so King Saul disobeys God and takes the plunder. And this is actually what ends up leading to King Saul's um, uh, dethronement, right? This, is, this sin, this particular uh, sin is actually what leads King Saul to lose his throne. And so the reason why this is important, right, is because when it says him and the Agagite, right, what it is telling us is that this is a continuation of the conflict, 
that's been going on for, thou- for hundreds of years. Right? The, the face-off between these ancient enemies is playing itself out in the person of Haman and the person of Mordecai. Right? Haman, the Agagites, and Mordecai, the Jew. It's this ancient conflict, hundreds of years old, and they're continuing to fighting uh, to this day. And so the, the reason why I give all that background is because this actually helps us explain the trickiest part of this passage. And I don't know if, you, if it affected you in any way when Andrew was reading this, but... Uh, a lot of people point this out because it is surprising what Esther does here. Right? So in verse 13 it says, And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed to do tomorrow, uh, be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The issue was decreed in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. And the Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So if you read kind of the commentaries, um, a lot of commentaries are really harsh on Esther here. Right, because what are we to make of her request? Right, what are we to make of it that Esther would actually ask the king to, one, let's let the battle ensue for one day longer so that we can kill more people who are against Israel, right? an additional 300 men died. And what are we to make of, number two, that Esther is asking Haman's already dead sons right, to be hanged. Right? And so all throughout the book, we, we have this image of Esther, right? or maybe if you grew up in church and you go to Sunday school, you have this image of who Esther is. Right? In the very beginning of the book, she's like quiet and submissive. She doesn't say anything. She just allows life to happen to her. In the middle of the book, right, we see her as heroic. Right? All of a sudden, she's able to you know, be very courageous and very savvy. She, right? she navigates all the politics of the Persian courts extremely well. And then all of a sudden, here at the very end of Esther, and I feel like this gets left out sometimes you know, in in Sunday school retellings is that all of a sudden here she's asking for this battle to keep going so that more people can die and for the sons of Haman to be hanged. Right? And so a lot of commentators are looking at this as like, what's going on with Esther, right? This kind of gives you a different side of what Esther might have been like. Was she like vindictive? Was she like vengeful? You know, or maybe she was like being really pragmatic, right? Is, is this a means for Israel's, uh, Israelites to be more wealthy and to you know, gain more mastery over their enemies? Right? What are we to make of this like pretty harsh sounding request that Esther makes to the king? Well, you know, I think this is what's going on here, right? And the reason why I gave all that background is because this, I don't think this was vengeful or vindicative, vindicative by Esther, right? And I also don't think that it was pragmatic. But rather, what Esther was doing here, right, is that she was pressing onward towards the completion of this ancient battle between the Agagites and the Israelites. So Esther was in a sense saying, you know, this, this long battle that we've been fighting ends here today. Right, we are going to finish this. This is not going to go on any longer. Right, the unfinished business that King Saul left for us all those generations ago right, is going to be finished here today. And the reason why I come to that conclusion is because, first, they did not take the plunder. Right, I don't know if you noticed that, that all throughout the passage it says they did not take the plunder. It's interesting because when Mordecai made the decree, right, the Israelites can take the plunder of the enemies that they conquer. But that actually doesn't happen. Uh, so three times in this passage, right, in verse 10, in verse 15, and verse 16, right, it says that the Jews, you know, they conquered the, the, the people that were attacking them, they defended themselves, and then it says they laid no hands on the plunder. Right, so why did they lay no hands on the plunder? Right, the reason for that is because King Saul was, supposed, was not supposed to take the plunder, but he did. All right, so what the Israelites are doing here in Esther's day is that even though they were allowed to take the plunder, they didn't. And so what they were doing is that they were doing what King Saul should have done. Right? They were wrapping up this battle. They were concluding this ancient battle between the Agagites and the, uh, and the Israelites. Right? And so they, they say, we're not going to take the plunder because that's what King Saul should have done. There's nice wrap-up, nice, uh, nice little bow tied on top. Right? Nice conclusion to this, uh, to this ancient uh, battle. But not only that, the second detail is the hanging of Haman's ten sons. Now, so Haman's sons were already dead, right? So if you've kind of followed the passage, they died in verse 7, right? But it isn't until verse 13 where Esther is asking for their bodies uh, to be hung from the gallows. And in some ways to our modern, you know, ears, that just sounds pretty repulsive, you know, that Esther would ask for such a thing, right? But there's actually, this actually serves two purposes, right? First, this is the end of the line for the Agagites, 
All right, so I know this is a little bit harsh to hear, but by killing all 10 sons of Haman, there's no one left to continue the line of the Agagites. All right, this is their family, family lineage is completely done. Right? There's no more Agagites to continue uh, this, 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 this battle. I know that sounds kind of harsh. But um, you know, Haman's dead. You know, his sons are dead. Haman lost his possessions. He lost his position. He lost his sons. He lost his property. He lost his life. Right? The ancient battle is over. Right? The Agagites are no more. But the hang on the gallows is actually also very significant. Because, um, and maybe this will open your eyes to the the Old Testament, but uh, this isn't the first time actually in the Old Testament where people were hanging on, on, on gallows and were hanging on a tree. So for example, in Joshua, it says uh, that he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And then later on in the book of Joshua, this is about the 10 kings of the Amorites, it says, and afterwards Joshua struck them and put them to death and he hanged them on five trees and they hung until the evening. Right? And so why is Joshua doing this, right? Why is it not good enough just to kill them? Why, do, why must they hang him on a tree? Well, the reason for that is because when someone hangs on a tree, right, it is representation that that person is under the curse of God. All right, so when someone is hanging from a tree, it means that they are under the curse of God, right? So hang with me here. No pun intended, but hang with me here. So um, there's a point in all this, right? So in Deuteronomy 21, right, it says, uh, and if a man... My jokes take a little while to get. So uh, if, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain uh, all night on the tree, but you shall bury him on the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. Right? And so by hanging the ten sons of Haman on a tree right, or on the gallows, uh, it is declaring that they are now cursed by God. Right? This is God's complete victory over the Agagites. But here's how this applies to us, right? And the reason why I said all that is because, you know, as we look at the Bible and we look at this book of Esther, you know, what is, uh, what is this pointing us to, right? Because who else was hung on a tree, right? Who else right, also was hung on a tree, right? And the answer is Jesus, right? Jesus was also hung on a tree. And we see this is the way, actually, that the early apostles describe Jesus' death, right? So in Acts uh, 5, Peter is talking here, and he says, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. And then chapter 10 in the book of Acts, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day. And then finally, Galatians, this is where Paul kind of lays it out for us. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You see, Esther requested for Haman's sons to be hung on a tree. And so that's one day, but one day we know that Jesus would also hang on a tree where he would become a curse for us. Right? Jesus took on the curse that we deserve right? so that we can have life. When Jesus hung on a tree, right, it was a display to the whole world that this man was under a, the curse of God. But yet, he did it for us, right, so that we can have life. You see, you know, Jesus actually changed everything, right? All this war business that went on in the Old Testament uh, no longer applies to us, right? Because through Jesus, when he took on the curse for us, it means that actually all Amalekites and all Jews and actually anyone on earth, right, can be brought together in peace, right? Because God is forming us into this one new community, Right, God is forming us into this one new people of God, right? one bride of Christ. And so as gruesome as it might be right, to think that Esther would request something like this, it actually reminds us right, of the wonderful uh, cross where Jesus hung on a tree and became a curse for us. Right, in many ways, this would have been unimaginable for the Jews right, during Esther's time. Right, that God himself would actually come down into the world that he created and hang on a cross and hang on a tree for us. Right, but yet, this is the, the glorious truth that gives us life in Christ. Right, and so, given all this, right, what is the proper response? Right, the first point is trusting in his word. Right, and so we see this in the fact that the Jews trusted in God's word, that when the decree of life went out, that they trusted in him. So what's the proper response to all this? And of course, the proper response is celebration. 
point, and this leads me uh, to the second point, is the celebration of our salvation. So if you take a look at verse 18, right, it says, But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day of the four- and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that day a feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. Right, so not only did they celebrate what God, that God had delivered them, they made it actually into a day of celebration for all future generations of Israelites to celebrate as well. Right, so we see this in verse 26. It says, therefore, they call these days a Purim after the term Pur. At, therefore, because of all that was written in the letter and of what they have faced in this matter and of what happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city, and these days of Purim shall never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Right, and the amazing thing is that from this time, the Jewish people continue to celebrate Purim every single year. Uh, And in fact, this celebration has already passed for this year. It was March 6th and March 7th of this year when the Jews, uh, when the Jewish people of today uh, continue to celebrate Purim. But even if you think about it, even the name Purim speaks of the great irony of the celebration. Because if you remember, Pur is is the name of the lots that Haman cast. Right, Haman cast Pur to determine the day when this destruction would come from the Jews. And it's ironic right, that the lot of God's people right, was not going to be determined by the lots that Haman threw. But rather, Israel's lot was going to be determined by God. Right? So even naming the holiday Purim, right, it, it, re- it reminds the Israelites right, that our lot in life is not a random cast of the die. But our lot in life is determined by God. And so in modern days, um, you know, the celebration would include uh, a lot of noisemakers. Um, the book of Esther, you know, would be read all the way through uh, for the celebration of Purim. And each time Haman's name is read, you know, you would like shake your noisemakers really loud. And that actually signifies the blotting out of Haman's name, which we actually see in this passage as well. So like when Haman's name is read, you shake your noisemakers, right, to blot out his name. And... Um, other things that would be included in the celebration would be to uh, give gifts to one another. And according to the commentaries that I read, that even the, the, the giving of gifts is a play on words, right? Because they would give portions of food to one another and to signify that their portion in God, right? They say give portions of food to one another to signify their portion in God, right? So your portion is kind of like your destiny. Uh, and so, but in addition to that, there would also be, you know, other things maybe more interesting things, to the celebration. Uh, Actually, according to the Talmud, which is kind of like the official commentary uh, for Jewish law that the rabbis in the past would, like, write. And so in the Talmud, it actually says that uh, part of the celebration, you have to keep on drinking until you can no longer hear the difference between blessed is Mordecai and cursed is Haman. And so, I don't know, take that for what you will. Um, But, you know, that's part of the celebration that's required in the Talmud. I guess, you know, in the New Testament, it tells us not to be drunk with wine, but, you know, take that for where you will. Another tradition, actually, is the making of these pastries uh, called Onai Osnai Haman. And so, uh, Osnai Haman. And so this literally means the ears of Haman. There's, like, these little corner puff pastries uh, that has, like, filling in them. And so, I tried really hard to figure out, you know, the reason for this, and it was really hard to find, like, an official reason why. Everyone has, like, different opinions as to why they make these things. Uh, so one, one tradition is that Haman would, used to wear, uh, would wear a three-cornered hat, right? So that's Haman's, like, dress everywhere you went. He wore a three-cornered hat, and which is what it represented. Um, and so, you know, maybe. Uh, the, another reason I found was that in chapter 6, right, when, when Haman went back to his house, right, if you remember, he had to parade Mordecai around the city, it says that he went home with his ears hanging low. And I don't know, they wobbled to and fro, but they, the, his ears were hanging low. Uh, and so that's an ancient idiom to mean, kind of just meaning that he had his tail between his legs, right? So to have your ears hang low, you know, it means that you're like drooping and you're sad, you know? And so uh, basically, you know, the Haman's ears is to represent his like sadness and his defeats, right? So, you know, I, I don't know. So it was, it was hard to find an agreed upon reason why, um, 
why they have these, but uh, that's part of their tradition and celebration today. And so, you know, how can we apply this, right? How can we apply this fact that the, um, the, the Jews were celebra- are celebrating Purim? Because obviously we don't celebrate Purim uh, here in our congregation. But so I think the way to think about this, right, is that the celebration of Purim is a celebration of God's deliverance for his people. And, you know, in fact, we have that as well, right? That's appropriate for us as well that we should also celebrate God's deliverance of us. And we actually have a weekly celebration of God's deliverance for, uh, for us as people. And you are actually participating in that right now. Right? This, every single Sunday, right, every worship service, in, men, in some ways is a weekly celebration of God's deliverance for us. Right? Every Sunday, this is a weekly celebration of our salvation that is in Christ. Right? Every Sunday, this is a celebration of what Christ has done for us. And we celebrate and remember his salvation for us. Right? So to make this kind of super practical, um, you know, what is your expectations right, for, us to, for you to consider? Right? What are your expectations when you come in on a Sunday, uh, Sunday morning? Right? What, are your, uh, what are you thinking about? What are you expecting to, to find here as we celebrate each and every Sunday? And, you know, to make this, you know, very practical, and uh, I've been trying to find the right moment to make this application, so I hope you don't mind that I make it here, but, um, you know, is there, you know, really an expectation of celebrating what God has done for us? And to make this really practical, I know, so, I know many of you aren't here when the call of worship is being read, and I know many of you aren't here when uh, the first song is being sung, and I'm not trying to be all guilt trippy because um, I don't feel, think that actually changes our hearts. And so the point is not to make a guilt trippy, but, you know, um, Amy and I actually really enjoy and have some great conversations, you know, between 9 and 9.30. You know, our kids are running around, other kids are running around, and it's just like fun, you know, to be in this room, you know, waiting for service, expecting, getting ready for service to, to start, right? And in church, you know, it's always crazy afterwards, you know, and it's really sweet, actually, the time of fellowship that we have before service, right? So in some ways, you know, imagine with me, you know, what if all of us made a point to be here at 9 a.m.? Or what if all of us actually made a point, you know, to be here and have that time of fellowship before service and actually have that time of expecting for what God has done? And imagine with me, right, that if all of us were here singing the first song, right? So I, the praise team, you know, does an amazing job, you know, I think choosing, you know, really rich, meaningful songs for us to sing together as a community, right? And so it's really a celebration of what God has done for us. And I know for me, you know, actually even today, I think, I don't know, the music team was just turned down a little bit, but I was able to hear the congregation singing, you know, and what an encouragement, you know, that is for me. All right, so, you know, imagine with me if, you know, there's an expectation that we have every Sunday, right, where uh, we, we, are, we know that we're going to hear from God's word, or we know that we're ready to hear of what God is, is doing uh, in us, right? Just as there's numerous Jewish holidays, right, throughout the year, I think we need re- weekly reminders, right, of who we are in Christ, right? Monday, when you go, actually even before Monday, right, maybe just you're thinking about all the things they have to do this afternoon, right? It's easy to forget God's place in our lives. And so in some ways, I want to make this a challenge, but not even just a challenge, but just an invitation for all of us to come together and fellowship together at 9 a.m. on a Sunday, right? Let's come with expectant hearts, right? Ready to sing God's praises, ready to hear from him, right? And each Sunday, ready to celebrate this new life that we have in Christ. You know, realistically, we're probably not going to be excited every single Sunday, you know, but maybe we can just take that one small step in that direction, right? Because celebration really is the appropriate response to our salvation and to our deliverance in Christ. Now finally, really quickly, um, just the last point uh, is longing for home. And I just want to uh, end, end off the, you know, because the book of Esther really ends in a kind of a really strange way. And so, you know, in verse 1 is like, King Azurus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea. And you're just like, okay, <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to do with this information? And, you know, to be fair, right, he goes on to explain how Mordecai was second in the land and how God really used Mordecai. But like, why, what is this random comment, you know, on taxes? And so this is actually interesting because we kind of skipped over this detail in chapter 2 because it seemed kind of insignificant then. But in chapter 2, in verse 18, it says, When the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants, it was Esther's feast, right? This is when Esther was made queen. And it says, He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts uh, with royal generosity. So back when Esther became queen, as part of the celebration, the king's like, all right, no taxes for everyone. You know, everyone's really happy. But now that, you know, everything has happened, 
And the king's like, okay, let's bring back taxes again. You know, we need some money. And so he brings back taxes. Now, what is the point of this? Right, the point is, as amazing as the deliverance of Israel was, right, this is a reminder that they're still under the rule of a foreign king. Right, this was a reminder that they still had to pay taxes to a pagan king. They're actually not yet home. I think the author includes this like mundane thing for us. It's, it's because to say to us, yes, there's much to celebrate. But the thing is, we're not home yet. Right? There's still a day coming when God's justice and grace and peace will reign over the entire earth and they will no longer be under the, the dominion of a foreign king. And right? so in many ways, we're not home yet either. Right? We are but yet pilgrims on the way home. And so as we consider, as we wrap up Esther, right, let us put our confidence in the God who saved us. Let us put our trust in the God who delivered us. And let us put our hope in the God right, who is faithful in all the ordinary events of our lives. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, this amazing book of Esther that you have um, written for us, um, that you have recorded for us and passed down faithfully through the generations. Uh, so, Father, that we can um, really see in the past of how you um, work through your people, and especially through the book of Esther, perhaps we see the brokenness and the sinfulness of the people of Esther, of Mordecai, of you know, all the Jews who were supposed to go back to Israel but didn't, and, are, and maybe not following you as they should. Uh, but in many ways, the book of Esther is a huge encouragement to, uh, to us as perhaps we don't follow you as we should every day. Perhaps we uh, are also compromised in our faith, but yet we see your faithfulness uh, through the book of Esther, through the ordinary events of life, through, uh, through what may seem like coincidences, but really you are the author and salvation of our life. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that they would be able to put their hope and their trust in you, the, the author of our salvation. We know that our 